Presented by the Hockey Shop, source for sports, Surrey, thehockeyshop.com. This is In Goal Radio, the podcast. Today, we go from one generation to the other. For the first time ever, we complete a father-son feature interview. You'll remember last year at the National Hockey League Draft, we spent uh, about an hour with Hall of Famer Martin Brodeur. Today, we catch up with one of his sons who is in the midst of a pro career that has taken him around the world and right now, a brand new team. We'll chat with Jeremy Brodeur in just a little bit. Plus, our gear segment takes us to Source for Sports Story, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. Cam chatting about uh, the new Vaughn line, the V Velocity 9 line, and uh, there's some uh, interesting new developments on that subject as Kevin Woodley uh, chats with Cam. No questions with Cam today as we get right into the gear segment as we bring in the co-founders of Ingoal Magazine, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison. Also some big things happening uh, over at Ingoal Premium and uh, and Ingoal Magazine with the publication of that uh, great uh, stick taping session with Braden Holtby Hutch. And the best part about that session is somebody gets that twig. Yeah, it's good to see you, gents. Um... Nice new piece up on uh, on premium. We've had a whole lot of stuff up there the last week, but uh, I think one of the ones people are really going to enjoy uh, will, is Braden Holtby doing about a, about a 10 minute walkthrough on taping his stick uh, with Woody up uh, in Kelowna one, one summer. In fact, I think we've got a little clip here about a minute, minute and a half uh, pieces pulled from the video that you'll see. Obviously, it's a real visual medium, but I think this will give you an idea of of what we've got up there for everybody. Down in here, I put kind of double tape because the stick would wear through and the graphite would start catching the ice and kind of going in wrong directions when you're flying around mainly, especially handling the puck. So I find it doesn't wear down quite as quick because us goalies don't usually retape our sticks in between periods or every game use a new stick. I just the, the flex just goes because I still use uh like a wood based stick, so it loses its its flex pretty or stiffness pretty quick. Always use grip. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't I haven't always used it. Um I used to use just regular tape. But it would uh gets real sticky and it kind of wrecks the palm of your your blocker over time. Uh, That's always the interesting part, the fun part. See if the tape splits the right way or not. Uh, I've done it really since I was young. I've tried to get away from it through the years, but I like it for picking the stick up off the ice, especially, and then I feel like my hand's more relaxed handling the puck because, you know, the stick's so heavy that you can rest it up against the knob and kind of use more feel instead of squeezing so hard to hold on to it. There she is, and then cut the toe off, and that's about it. So there you go, a few highlights from the video of uh, Holtby walking us through his stick taping routine. Uh, keen listeners will notice that he was talking about using a new stick every game because of the flex. And at the time we filmed this, he was one of the the last guys in the league to be using a a a, a foam core stick, and uh, has since switched to a to a composite. But um, still, really fascinating piece. I th- I think obviously what once you see it, and and we had a little fun with it in the video. Um, the most interesting part has to be that that signature uh, huge knob at the top of Holtby's stick. I think you're going to be impressed by the number of wraps of tape that goes around the knob. I think when you invest in an InGoal Premium membership, you didn't realize that it's probably going to have to come with an extended tape budget as well. We had one parent <laughs> give us a shout out on on Twitter and mention that uh, their their little goalie had uh, retaped their stick four times already since watching that video so uh apologies for the extra tape costs everybody but it is a really really cool uh inside look at what uh, holtz does with his stick 
And uh, because that is still sitting in the office after that tutorial, in uh, on Monday, this Monday coming, we're going to give it to one of our in goal premium members. So uh, nothing members need to do. They're already entered in the giveaway. And if you're not a member, um, now's a good time to sign up. Perfect. Get a chance to win and you get some uh, incredible content. Now, the, it's interesting that Holpe still uses that uh, size of a knob because the trend has been to uh, to go a little bit smaller over the last uh, number of years. And interesting, yeah, but... interesting he mentions in it, he actually likes it for puck handling too. It's not just the old school big knob so it's easy to pick up your stick if you drop it. Um, so, And that's what I like about these tutorials is, Kevin, you always manage to get those extra questions in there to pull out. It's not just a how to do it, but why are you doing it this way? So that's what makes them so good. Plus, hope is just damn cool. So it's nice to have that video. Even yeah. if yes. ten, even if out of the 10 minutes, like three or four of them are actually him just taping that gigantic knob on the end of the stick. And actually, this is going to be one of the challenges when we pick a winner, shipping that thing. Because we're going to yes. have to pay extra to yes. ship it so yeah. the knob doesn't come off. We'll have to like... We we'll have to like bubble wrap the end of it so that knob stays on. But uh, good guy, um, got lots of cool little quirks to him in terms of the way he plays and some of his gear, and a little bit old school, a little bit of throwback, and so a lot of that comes through in the video. And uh, that's why we're all goaltenders because we love to have our quirks, and he's uh, he's right up there. Uh, one observation was when I was a kid, my dad started uh, putting sponge pucks on the uh, end of my stick as as the knob to save tape because it's, why would I why would you just put all that tape on there for this big dobby cut down the sponge but it was kind of ingenious actually uh pops ahead of his time number two is he's one of the few that goes with the 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 big knob all the way around because the puck can slide underneath the shaft of a stick and and I've seen it happen actually with Braden uh the benefits outweigh that but uh but he goes sort of against what Dominic Hatchick did who put a smaller uh, knob where the shaft went down when he went paddle down so he could poke check with the with the shaft of a stick if that makes sense well what uh, I and then he had to bother I, I, it's funny as you were talking about that I remembered trying something inspired by Hashik and I don't know if he did it this way and I had I'd read it or I just took it another level but I actually pulled out the old box cutter knife and I trimmed off the bottom edge of the knob so it was actually only yeah. a half knob so I assume that's what he was doing because he played so uh, with with paddle down and, and yeah, stick exactly. down so often, and and I like it when when we can bring up things that makes make Woody's face go all scrunchy. Like, what the hell are you talking about? You guys are just too old for me. What can I say? No, um, <laughs> you you predate me. No, no. Um, I was actually just kicking myself over here because uh, we did uh, we were talking about doing a segment, and it's a good segue to the hockey shop and Source for Sports and the HockeyShop.com because we were talking about doing a gear segment on. You know, some of the tape alternatives to building the knob on your goalie stick. And they've obviously got them in stock at the hockey shop. Uh, Butt Ends is one of the companies that they stock extensively. So different colors. Basically, it's like a like a rubberized wrap that you pull over the end of the stick and you can get different size of knobs. And you don't have to, A, waste the tape, but you don't have to spend the effort. Now, hey, a lot of us like spending that extra time, but... Um, not everybody does. So just slap on a butt end. You've got a built-in knob. It's the same thickness every time. What did what was Malcolm Subban's hutch? He said he went around thirty-eight times, or it he was an exact count. number. Yeah, but Holby yeah. blows that out of the water. We actually put the count up on the screen on the video. I won't give it away, but go watch. Yeah. So wow. so so if you don't want to spend that time, you don't want that precision. Although we did enjoy both Brayden and Malcolm showing us how they do it. Uh, something like butt ends, and you know this is again this is why we go to the hockey shop. Uh, source for sports in Surrey. This is why we work with the hockey shop and the hockey shop.com because it's not just about all the latest and greatest. And, and obviously, Cam talking today about the V9 line, um, some exciting things coming in. We got our Bauer ultrasonic pads and gloves this week. That'll be at hockey shop. And of course, 2S Pro is now on sale. Uh, CCM is coming with the axe. It's like it's that time of year. And yet, for all the new gear that makes you excited to go in and check it out at the hockey shop, they've also got all your accessories taken care of, whether it's butt ends whether it's good tape, um, you name it, they got it. Uh, that's why we go. That's why you should go check them out at the Hockey Shop Source of Sports in Surrey or online at thehockeyshop.com. You know how we discuss sales at the Hockey Shop and they're, they're clearing out last year's line or two years ago line? Right. And, and I know there's, there's some people that say, mm, I really want the, uh, the most up-to-date gear. And there's something to be said for that. But I'm watching up close right now a National Hockey League goaltender 
who is going to be a Hall of Famer, who reached back and went to last year's pads, a set of pads from a year ago that he wore a few times, pulled them out, and has decided to wear them. I don't know how long he's going to wear them, but we're talking about Marc-Andre Fleury, and he's had success with them. And I just thought, isn't that an interesting take that he's using technically, and I use the, the bunny ears, uh, old technology, because they are from a year ago. Uh, I don't know how much that pad has necessarily changed, but let's let's just say it's it's a year old pad. And uh, and Marc Andre Fleury has decided to to go with it. Now here's the story. He's wearing the gold pads. You guys have seen them on the Beautiful. highlights a little oh, bit. Yeah. Love yeah. love the gold pads. Really cool. He wore them for a few games last year, and then went back to his traditional white uh, white setup. And the uh, Golden Knight uh, Foundation uh, had them in. They had the Night to Remember big team event that most most clubs have uh, for charity. They put them in the silent auction. And they brought them down to the dressing room for him to sign them. And Nate Schmidt, defenseman with the Golden Knights, took them because he loves them. Took them, put them in Mark's stall, and, and uh, brought them in and said, you've you got to wear these. you got to wear these again. And, and Mark did. And shout so, out. Yeah, shout out. After the auction we, closed? No, no. Be, he took them out of the auction. Oh, like they weren't available. Like they, oh, okay. they weren't available. They, they had all these sticker uh, of authenticity, everything already on them. All they needed was the signature, and then they were going in the auction. Instead, he donated a game used mask. Wow. And yeah. uh, that went for like 30 grand, 35 grand. Oh, my uh, gosh. But he, but he, so he takes the pads off the auction block, puts them into a game. Gets a shutout, is 2-0 and with them, using uh, last year's technology, and, and he'd been scuffling a little bit, and I just wonder, I'll put it to you guys. He'd, he'd had some success with them last year, had a shutout, only wore them for a handful of games, but just that, that little mind reset, going back to something that, uh, that, that looks good, your teammates want you to wear it, uh, whether, whether there's something there or not, but it's, it's made a difference in his game. Well, from a technology standpoint, I can say that there isn't much of a difference because you know, flowers, 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 old school as it is, right? He's still got leather straps. We've had this conversation with him. We had it in articles. He's like, I remember a couple of years ago, I'm telling me he still had the the leather straps and metal buckles, which obviously make a significant weight increase on the pad on his, on his premier line. And he's like, yeah, he's like, uh, I'm one of a kind now. Kind of like I'm old school, but also like nobody has it anymore. And he liked the red straps on his, on his white pads. He thought that added an element of style, right? And he's always been a stylish guy. So um, so I don't think it makes a difference from a performance perspective, but you know, clearly Darren, um, you mentioned it hasn't been the season he wanted that they want uh, so far there in Vegas. And it, it sure felt like a guy maybe looking for something, look good, feel good, play good, that old mantra, like maybe searching a little bit. And interestingly enough, your, your broadcast partner reached out and asked me, you know, did I have the numbers? Could I find the numbers on, on what Fleury's record was last year? And I sent them to Mike. I think they made their way into your broadcast. He was only two two and two with a nine thirteen save percentage, which is his career average, and a two nine seven goals against average, which is well above his career average. Like he didn't actually have outside of the first time he wore them last year with the shutout, he didn't actually have a ton of success in them. But hey, look good, feel good, play good. He's Shake obviously. It up. Yeah, he's, his teammates know, want him to wear it because they're excited uh, about it. Yeah, and hey, and listen, what have we said all the time? Like Mark Andre Fleury is the last starting goaltender in the NHL that still plays last puck, even if he's even yeah. if in the pregame warm up, even if he's the guy that's playing that night. And he's always said, and, and I've written stories about it. Like, there's a real value to having fun, especially for him. Like that's a big part of it. And he's out there and he's having fun and he's having a good time and it's good to see because it's not like he stopped being a good goaltender. Um, it's amazing what little things can sort of, sometimes it's one save. In this case, it's just, you know, set of gear, makes him feel good. And now he's on a roll. It'd be nice to see him as much as the people here in Vancouver behind me, because I'm at Rogers Arena yeah. today, don't want to see them get on a roll. I, I'd kind of like to see it. I, I just thought it was cool that he takes something off the off the auction table. That is and, cool. And puts it on and says, I'll, I'll wear this. So, and uh, cool that he put the mask back in there, too. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah made sure that the, uh, that the charity uh, made sure that they had something to auction off. And uh, and now the pads, when they the pads and gloves go back in next year, because I assume they will. Yeah. The value, the value should be even even higher. So there's your little uh, little gear update. Very rarely do I have a front row seat like uh, like you guys have that information. <laughs> but it was uh, it was all the prodding of Nate Schmidt, 
and it happened and uh, and Vegas is uh, enjoying the fruits of uh, of that gold uh, gear. So uh, we have a a father son combination. We're going to complete. We're going to go down the uh, the the family tree today with uh, with Jeremy Brodeur. Do you want to set the table a little bit here on uh, on just where everybody slots in in the in the family, Woody? Uh, Jeremy, there's two, two sons that play goal. Anthony, who was, of course, the made headlines the year that he was drafted. I think the draft might've been in New Jersey, remember in the seventh round and Marty came down and announced the pick. If I remember correctly, that's older brother, Anthony, who has since gone back to school and is playing in, as Jeremy says, in the CIS Canadian university. Um, Jeremy played in the Ontario hockey league, uh, finished, I think 2017, and we talked about it a little bit. It's been a bit of a, he's, he's had to bounce around. And, you know, it is kind of fascinating because it wasn't that long ago that there were jobs in the East Coast Hockey League and you could sort of go in there as a, as a young pro, even if you weren't drafted, if you had some upside and kind of establish yourself and maybe get a shot in the A and move up. Nowadays, like teams are five, six deep uh, on their depth chart and they're sending, you know, signed, uh, you know, NHL drafted prospects all the way down to the East Coast Hockey League. It's really tough to sort of get a look out of nowhere if you don't have a team affiliated with you. And that was one of the subjects we talked about. And then the decision to go over to Europe. I mean, what, what put him on our radar was he, he just signed a contract this morning, actually. It was announced uh, with Sheffield uh, in the EIHL uh, in, in London, England. And we just thought the timing was perfect. And uh, I was, I was, I'm excited to, to sort of share the story uh, of what it's like to be that guy who's trying to get a foothold and trying to get an opportunity uh, starting in North America and, and through a lot of different teams. Some of them are on the Hockey DB, but not all of them. You'll hear him talk about teams that, you know, frankly, aren't even listed anywhere as him having played for them. And now over in Europe and, and having a different experience, uh, first first in Budapest and now now in England. It's uh, it's an interesting story and, you know, one we don't get to tell very often. So I enjoy chatting with him about it. And what a journey and trying to do it his own way. Struggled in the East Coast Hockey League, but this year, uh, started off five and one in the Southern Professional Hockey League with outstanding numbers, but just r- there wasn't enough room for him. So a little bit of time in Budapest, and now we'll finish the year. I think they have 14 games left uh, with Sheffield. This is Jeremy Brodeur, son of Martin, but carving his own path towards uh, a career in professional hockey. Jeremy with Kevin on In Goal Radio, the podcast, our feature interview presented by Source for Sports Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. Pleased to be joined on the podcast by Jeremy Brodeur, live from Sheffield, England, where he the, the contract was announced today, Jeremy, that you've signed with Sheffield for the remainder of the year. Are you there? Are you physically there? How long have you been there? Like, walk us through what has been a pretty unique year for you. Yeah, so it's been a very interesting year. I kind of, uh, I started out uh, having a tough year last year, kind of uh, bounced around getting sporadic starts in the, the East Coast. And I was uh, kind of having trouble finding a place in America to play. And then, uh, so it happened to be my uh, my coach from the first year when I got cut in uh, Wichita, my first year, he was my coach for about a week in Evansville in the SPHL before I went to Allen and he uh I just shot him a quick text because he was coaching in Atlanta and then he said yeah I'd love to have you here so I ended up going to Atlanta at the beginning of the year and then we uh kind of ran into a numbers game where they got some goalies sent down and then they had to let me go so after that I signed in Peoria in the SPHL which I thought what for me ended up being a great decision. They had a, a great program there with a an opportunity a few weeks in, jumped out to me to go play in Budapest, which uh, was very uh, interesting for me. I kind of thought about it for a second, but then I ultimately kind of decided my goal was to end up playing in Europe. So I thought no better place to start than uh, in Budapest. So, you, sorry, and you cut out there for a second, Jeremy, but you were talking about Peoria and obviously had a great run there, 944 save percentage in the six games. Um, how tough is it these days to find a place to play when you're not affiliated with an NHL team? I think we've seen this a lot where 
guys are having success. And then, especially as teams start to use the East Coast League as a place to put prospects, it wasn't that long ago that, um, you know, most of the guys down there weren't really affiliated. And now most of them are affiliated with an NHL team. Like, how tough is this to find a place to play? As a young guy trying to prove yourself at the at the pro ranks, like you said, the last couple of years, 17, 18, uh, 2018, 19, and then this season, a lot of bouncing around. How, what's that process like? Are you relying on an agent? Are you relying, like you said, contact personally with coaches to make it happen? You know, how difficult it is, is it being in that spot and trying to find, you know, something that fits? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... It's really hard to find, like, uh, if you're not on a contract, I find it's really hard to to solidify yourself in one spot. I mean, obviously some guys do, but generally all the right pieces have to fall in the right place to to really uh, solidify, like, a great situation. Like, um, for example, my first year, I got cut right away in Wichita, then I went to Evansville. And then I got to Allen because a goalie went down and he was out for the year with a concussion. And so I kind of had a job there and then San Jose didn't have any other prospects to send down and cause they already had one down there. So I ended up splitting time up my first year, which at the end, like when you look at it at the end of the year, like just everything fell in the right place for me uh, to have a season like that. Then I come in the year after and then, things kind of bounce around and then I go to Norfolk after and then they have a an NHL signed goalie and and there's nothing you can do at that point because those guys kind of have to play so it's a it's a tough situation to or it's very tough I guess in the east coast to solidify yourself but I mean it's been done before but I I just feel like things have to fall in place I suppose well it sounds like I said like talking to teams and seeing how many guys they end up like you said, end up sending their own prospects down there. Um, it's getting tougher every year, it seems. So, uh, you, you spent a little time with San Jose in, in 17, 18. Did you, um, with the Barracuda? Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. Up- how long were you there? Did, did you get a taste of, uh, of Nabby as a goalie coach? Yes, I did get to work with Nabby up there. That was a, a really cool experience. And yeah, I actually ended up getting called up there when, uh, I, I believe it was because they traded Troy Grossnick to Nashville. So they had an yeah, open we know spot Grosser. for one of us to go up. And I didn't end up getting into any games, but ultimately it was a great experience to see the level up there in the AHL. And uh, obviously work with Nabby was was awesome. Similar last year, uh, a little stint up in bingo, didn't get any games, but would you have had a chance to work with Scott Clementson? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, we got, to, we got to speak a lot. I was there for about a week and a few days, I believe. And that was a, another weird situation. They kind of... I think it was when Schneider got hurt and then they called up Cam Johnson right away. And we were on the road. I was actually a scratch in Adirondack or in Manchester the night before. And we, uh, they needed a goalie right away. So they just kind of fell into place right there to be there for a week and a half. That was also another, uh, another cool, uh, cool little week and a half there to see uh, how they run their program over there. Have you gotten pretty good at uh, packing light and living out of hotels after all this? Because that is a lot of bouncing around yeah. for the past couple of years. Yeah. What, what's the secret? Uh, definitely uh, find a way or find a good stretchy duffel bag that you can fit a lot of clothes in. And then put your suits in your hockey bag and make sure they're wrapped nicely so they don't smell. <laughs> <laughs> uh any any tips for i mean we've seen it where uh we've had guys that uh, get caught out on the road with their team and they get an unexpected call up and they don't have their passport or they get on the plane but they've you know their their bags and in your case it would be your goalie equipment um doesn't make it or an element of it doesn't make it any 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 lessons learned the hard way? Any tips for other guys who are traveling with a lot of gear on how to make sure everything gets there, not to mention the suits without smelling like the gear in the bag? Oh, I'm not sure. I mean, the only real bad experiences I've had with uh, forgetting gear and whatnot was in junior. I forgot my blocker on a three and three road game. Ooh. So that was a tough one. But uh, the other team ended up having a, a nice CCM carry price pro return blocker for me to use for the weekend. So that was, that was lucky. <laughs> that worked, that worked, that worked out okay for you. Yeah. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. 
I, I'm guessing the one that, but the only thing worse was if you could forget, if you forget your can, you might be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. So let's get back to this year. Budapest, your first experience overseas. Like you said, this is something you were looking to do. The opportunity presents itself. What was that experience like? You're not just walking into a new team. You're walking into a new country, a new culture. What was the hockey like? Was What was the off ice like from an adjustment standpoint? Uh, yeah, very, uh, very different and interesting in a, in a positive way, I would say. Um, yeah, no, so getting to Budapest was, uh, was pretty interesting. Uh, it was a 16-hour flight total. I had two layovers. I went from St. Louis to Chicago, Chicago to Istanbul, then Istanbul to uh, finally Budapest. And I was just thankful that all my gear made it, <laughs> made it to Budapest. And uh, I think more than other countries, I think Budapest was probably a lot different experience than playing in other, other places just because uh, English is less of an importance there compared to other countries, I believe. So... I only had about three or four guys that spoke like good, good English. And obviously the, my coaches were, uh, were Swedish. So that, that wasn't an issue, but it was just different. Like being around in the, in the locker room where, where like guys are not speaking English primarily and just kind of having to pretend like, you know, what's going on. <laughs> you get, you get a new appreciation for what guys go through coming over yeah. to North America when they don't speak it. Exactly. 100%. And I, I ultimately, I, I enjoyed, you know, like learning bits and pieces of Hungarian and all that. So, and we, we had a bunch of Finnish guys in our team too. I think we had two or three. So, but the, as far as the hockey goes, it was a lot different. I, they, I mean, there's a lot of more passing and, you know, staying on your feet because you know a guy's going to pass back door and not shoot the puck. But uh, it's, uh, it, that, as you say, that sounds like a lot what we hear about, about, playing in Europe that the importance of not committing early and everything is East West. And so you have to like, there can be some real positives. We've hear guys tell us about developing their game just because they don't have a choice, but to hold their edges and be patient laterally. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100% that it's, it's helped me with my movement. And I got to work uh, with a, a, a really good goalie coach from Finland. His name was, Oh, I, I forget his last, uh, how to say his last name, but his name was Ale. He, uh, he works with, uh, let's see, I'm looking up right now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Ale, uh, Ale Jaska Linen. He, uh, he works with a uh, goalie pro, which is a, a Finnish company that I think. Yeah. We're, we're, we're familiar with it yet. Yeah, we've had some stuff with them in the past. Yeah. So you can open it. So I've been, I've been working with them with video and all the time there. So I, I had a really good experience learning, uh, you know, his way of, uh, the way his mind works about goaltending and his uh his technical preferences and all those things so although can you give us because you this audience is i mean obviously all goalies you're speaking to jeremy so is there any example you can give us some of the nuances of of what made his approach different and what might have been new to you um you know working with him uh yeah we worked uh, a lot on uh focusing your eyes and head tracking we we did like the first drill of most practices with those uh, swivel goggles. Right. So just every first drill with those, and he like for me personally, he was just he wanted me to present my hands uh, forward a little bit more, and instead of kind of using like a a bailout chicken wing save on the glove side to like just like move my glove uh, laterally more to make saves and just little things like that that were things that I think if I had the full year there that I kind of benefited from benefited more from, but I, we didn't really have too much time considering the season's pretty much over, over there anyway. So I, I kind of was more focused on trying to win hockey games and little things like that instead of, you know, developing long-term things there. But I definitely, it's something I'm going to translate over to the summer where I have a lot more time off to, uh, kind of focus more on okay so and and you mentioned that the, the league's kind of like so walk me through how you end up in sheffield where we're talking to you today yeah so uh we ended up having like one or two more games left here in uh or back in budapest and then we got a 
a call from Sheffield saying that they wanted to have a, you know, a, another goalie to support because they had a they have a, a starter named Thomas Duba. He's a he's an older guy who has a lot of experience in a lot of leagues in Europe, and he's been their main guy. And then they asked me to come over and kind of be a supporting role for him. So I mean, with only having one game left in the season in Budapest, it was a, a no-brainer to come here and especially I've heard a lot of good things about this league here in England so and if it's something I want to do in the future I felt like that was the best opportunity to you know come over here and see what it's like and hopefully have some success in this latter part of the season. How much time's left in the year there? I believe they have uh, 13 games and playoffs left. Oh so so there's an opportunity to get into some that's great. Yeah. What, uh, what's, what's been the toughest part? You know, you may, I, I focused a little bit on bouncing around, um, through all these different teams and all these different leagues over the last, you know, three years since you finished up with the Oshawa generals in, in 2017. But the part that I, I never even thought to ask, but hearing you talk about, you know, having a goalie coach and learning a new thing here and there, like I'm guessing in a lot of these stops, you probably wouldn't have had much help. And then in other cases where you did, like all those different voices over a short period of time, how has it helped you or been a challenge at different times to sort of um, figure out what your foundation is, what your game is amidst, uh, at times, I'm guessing, not a lot of help and at other times, a lot of people with different suggestions. That, that can be difficult. Yeah, there is. A, it's very interesting because like sometimes you go to some teams in the East Coast where there's no one evaluating you from a goalie standpoint besides your coach who really cares about if you win or lose games. And, right. and then like on those little call-up stints, uh, you have goalie coaches there who really want to help you develop and dissect your game. Even if you're not playing just because they're focused on your development. So it is very interesting in, uh, you know, trying to keep your own focus when you're, in those spots where you don't have someone to work with or someone to tell you if you have a habit that's creeping up on you, that's uh, going to have a negative impact on your game. So, I mean, I would say like, even in like at the beginning of this year, I didn't have a goalie coach in Peoria, but I thankfully had a, a good relationship with my uh, goalie partner there, Eric Levine, who, uh, I mean, anytime I saw anything in his game where I thought like, maybe I'd ask him, how he goes about things or as he would to me, or even in a game, if he thought, you know, maybe my depth wasn't good or something, we would try to help each other out a little bit and we would do video with each other as well. Oh, that's great. I'm guessing that, that you didn't have those to like, I mean, that that's gotta be tough too, bouncing around. You don't get a chance to build on those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I always like to have an open mind about, uh, you know, just goaltending in general, like even in Budapest with my goalie partners there, like just little things that they they tack on that I some maybe wouldn't have caught or things they work on that people don't work on in the states as much just little things like that and obviously with the last name people are going to wonder well why doesn't he just phone dad for advice <laughs> have you uh, what what's that what's that been like like how much do you guys talk about the position obviously one of the all time greats uh, having him as your dad do you guys talk about how you play or style or uh, what's that relationship like as a pro and how has it evolved over the years as a goalie? Cause I know one thing as a goalie, you never want your kid to be a goalie cause it's so much pressure <laughs> and everything. How have you guys, how have you guys managed that? Yeah. I mean, my dad's he's, he's, he's awesome for that. We, we don't really talk crazy much about like technical, like hands here, feet here type of things, but like right. he, he watches as much as he can of all our games. He's pretty, pretty busy with work now with the devils and stuff but uh but yeah like i call him after games to see what he thought and if there's one thing that he saw even if we lost a one or we won eight zero he would point something out to me if he thinks it's you know a little habit or anything that's going to help me he'll say it but yeah no I, i talked to both my parents after each game just to see what they thought and he'll tell me and it's never like uh like hostile at all or anything it's it's awesome like even like small thing here's a like a small example i would say like maybe if i went to go play the puck behind the net and i passed it like he he always had a rule to like follow the puck 
once you pass it like back to your net not go the other way around the net or just like little things like that that he might have saw during the game that's a good tip <laughs> not and it doesn't it's not bad when it comes from one of the best puck handlers of all time yeah, so that's exactly. it probably <laughs> probably carries a little more weight um what was it like and i gotta ask what, what was it like growing up um with your dad like at what point did you know you wanted to be a goalie like dad was that ever a conversation that was like yeah i don't know you know i don't know if you really want to <laughs> this position is something you want to do because it is so hard well I'll, I'll put it one way. My first year of travel hockey, I scored one goal and zero assists as a forward. So I said, okay, I'm going to play goalie instead. <laughs> and I was going to say, it's not like you're alone there, right? Uh, Anthony's what? He's a year older than yeah, you. So goalies in the family. How much do you guys talk about the position and, and it, can he be a guy that's a sounding board? Do you guys play similarly? Like, are there style differences? Do you know each other's game? What are those conversations like? Uh, yeah, I think we play a little bit differently. I mean, he's a little – he's like a, a few inches shorter than me, and I, I play definitely more of a, a flat-down butterfly style than he does, but he's he, he's a good goalie. He's playing at University of Ottawa right now. But, yeah, we I, yeah. I try to watch his games as much as I can. He watches mine the same amount. So anytime he sees something, maybe he'll be like, oh, wow, that was a bad goal you let up or something, or that was a nice save or <laughs> – but it's, oh, th- th- I was going to say the first comment. Thanks, brother. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it, it's all fun and good. We 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 chat about it a lot, and uh, we have a pretty good relationship from that standpoint. What's that like growing up in a goalie family, especially when when you know when your dad is one of the more famous goaltenders in the history of the game? How are you, positives are there negatives that can come with it? People chirping you over the years. Like, what's that like? Have you how have you managed that? Oh yeah, I mean it's it's kind of something I've always been used to since uh since the very beginning uh you yeah. know people like always uh share me about my dad or whoever or, which is a, it's kind of hard it's you get it, it you almost just laugh at it you know it's nothing really to uh <laughs> to get right like people just try to get in your head but it's at the end of the day it's just it's funny when people try to bring little things up like that i mean to me like people would say oh it's a lot of pressure and this and that but to me I, I i love having my dad being who who he is and what he's accomplished and i'm i'm happy that i'm i can you know try to follow his footsteps a little bit and play professionally at the highest level i can eventually and and obviously you know you mentioned butterfly goaltending i mean i don't know how many stories i've written over the years about your dad sort of bucking that butterfly trend early in his career and playing a different way is there are there elements or things you talked about the puck handling where you've learned in your game that you apply it that might not be quite as, you know, structured as say we might associate with the modern butterfly where the conversations like that, especially as a kid about, about style and about approach or did, was he good about just sort of letting you guys develop your own style and work with your own coaches and finding your own yeah. way in the game? Yeah. I mean, like we rarely had like ice sessions where we don't like, he would go on and like teach us and stuff. He really was a big believer in letting us out and, go do our own thing you know like with with whatever our goalie coaches like he never like gone the way he let them do their things and you know kind of let us take in whatever advice from as many people as possible and apply it as as you will to to our games and whatnot so yeah no he definitely just wanted us to go out and play and even to this day like he just he wants us to go out and figure out what kind of goalie we want to be or what kind of style to play on our own. Now I got to ask you, I meant to ask this earlier. What made you love the position? Like you talked about being a forward and only having one goal in the season. So you, that was time to become a goaltender, but what'd you end up loving about it when you, when you got the pads on and got in the net that kept you in there? Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I, I love playing uh, just goalie just because, you know, I, I like being that last line of defense for our team. I like, I like being able to control like the game, you know, I, I just, I find it so satisfying, even if like, I, I, I like to be a big, big part of the game. So, and I've always found a, a goal, like being a goalie, you're always a big part of your team and like you could help win and lose games and whichever that result is, I was okay with. I, I love, loved having that weight on my shoulders. Do you think that's part of like a, a, a... I find it interesting to hear that answer. Like, I think that's something that you almost have to have to, to make it at the professional level, to play at the level, highest levels like, like you guys are. 
um, you know, to make it out of, you know, just minor hockey, that, that passion to sort of embrace all those pressures that other people, you know, even, even I talk about like, oh, the pressures of the position on your kids, as I mentioned earlier, you kind of got to embrace that to succeed, don't you? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely feel that's a, that's a very big part of the game. And I, I personally enjoy it a lot. You know, you can let in a bad goal and someone could say like the game's your fault or this and that, or you, you save the game with a big save. I think like I, that's just an aspect of the game that I love, whichever way it goes. I mean, it's, it's part of the game. Okay. So Sheffield, England, uh, how long have you been there? When did you get, we saw the announcement today. That's what prompted this call and get you on as a guest this week uh, on the Ingo radio podcast, but how long have you actually been there? And, and, and how's the transition so far? What's the toughest part of, I guess it's the language at least is a little easier, yeah. but, uh, yeah. and the, and the pubs are good, but you have to stay out of them till the season's over. Yeah. No, uh, I've been here since uh, 9 p.m. last night, so not too long, not even a full day yet. Wow. But I got on the ice this morning, and it felt pretty good to be in a, you know, with a, a very uh, successful team so far this year. We're, uh, they're, they're in first place right now, so they're not really messing around this year. So it's, uh, no, it was, it was good to skate with some, some high-end players and uh, hopefully get to continue that and get to play in some games. and have some success for the rest of the season as a team would be, would be awesome. Okay. Last one. What's it like you walk in it? Like, what is that like walking in for those of us who haven't done it, especially at that level, at the professional level, walking into a locker room the first time as the new guy, especially midway through a season, we're coming up on the NHL trade deadline this next week. And I got to write stories about how hard it can be as a goalie to switch teams. You know, this as well as anyone, how tough is that first, first venture into the room yeah the first venture is uh it's interesting because you don't know the setup of the locker room you don't know how things work like all all teams have like locker room rules like you know you put your shoes here you put that there and little things like that like I didn't even know which stall was going to be mine where to hang up my clothes when I'm when I change into my hockey stuff and just all the little things it's, it's very uh interesting but you have to you have to embrace it you know you get like hockey teams are usually tight knit families. So you can, all you got to do is just try to get in there and, you know, talk to guys, learn, make sure you learn everyone's name and then get along. I mean, I, thankfully I had a buddy that I played with while I was in Allen in the East coast that's playing here now. So I kind of had a, a little head start to show me the ropes a little bit around the room and stuff and kind of get used to how is that this are. Is that the secret to fitting in quick? Just try and get like as simple as getting to know guys' names so you can start to build relationships? Yeah, I mean, and just obviously when you're new, everyone knows you're new, so don't be afraid to ask questions and make sure just, I mean, everything you do is to your benefit to get as comfortable as possible and uh, making sure all that's good just so you can focus on playing hockey. All right, Jeremy. Well, listen, uh, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you doing this on short notice. Congratulations on the new gig in Sheffield. Be careful if you end up behind the wheel. I've been told they drive on the yeah. wrong side of the road yeah, over that's there. that's definitely something to get used to. It's very, uh, very different. <laughs> uh, I, I remember the last time I went through, actually, I think we're on a family trip coming back from Italy and we just did an overnight um, just outside of London on route back home and just the car ride from one airport to the hotel <laughs> some of the turns you're just like i know for sure in my head that i would screw it up because it would just you're trying even when you try and think about it some of the and you get into like roundabouts and stuff i would be in trouble so be careful with that <laughs> but have an awesome time with that uh, with sheffield best of luck the rest of the season um and we'll have to catch up soon really yep. enjoyed this conversation i i know our listeners at ingle are going to enjoy this conversation and we can't thank you enough for taking the time, especially at a time where you're changing countries and teams in the last 12 hours. No, I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Okay, all the best. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Jeremy Broder, uh, Sheffield, will follow his uh, career and the rest of this season in particular with great interest to uh, see how things uh, sort out there. But uh, having spent the time with Martin, uh, that we did at the draft uh, on In Goal Radio, the podcast. Uh, you see that the uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree as far as just a, a calm, cool, casual, enjoys talking about the game, uh, Hutch, uh, in Jeremy. Didn't he? Um, you know, I thought it was impressive how Kevin set up the interview talking only about Jeremy's uh, career. 
And as I was working through it, I was thinking to myself, Kevin, you're going to remember to ask him about his relationship with his father, I hope, sometime. And please, please tell, please talk about Marty. Please talk about yeah, Marty. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I'm thinking, now, how is he going to feel when Kevin brings it up? Because he's probably sick and tired of it. But it was so chill. It was so relaxed. It was just, yep, he's somebody who's important in my life. And my mother is too, by the way, guys. And uh, and it was very matter of fact. I loved it. Um, you know, as I was saying before, the, the piece that that really struck home for me, though, is not just just here's this guy, son of a Hall of Famer, trying to carve a career and and how difficult that has been. But but I also started to visualize all the other people being affected every time somebody moves in the pro ranks. So the NHL team ships a guy down to the American League or calls a guy up from the American League and and there's you know, probably a dozen different lives being affected and there's hotels involved and there's travel involved and, and, uh, you know, somebody, somebody in New Jersey, Vancouver, Montreal, wherever makes a decision. And suddenly somebody way down the line in maybe even the Southern professional leagues, getting a tap on the shoulder, being told something different's about to happen to him. It's, uh, it's a tough life. I like the tip, uh, about playing the puck and following the puck uh, the same way back to the goal. I, I, will, I just never thought of it that way. Like just, just a little, you got a little insight into the way Martin's brain works and, and the influence on, on Jeremy. Well, and Hey, the other thing too, about, uh, the hard life hutch and, and how you can get bounced around. I will say we, we didn't, we weren't able to include it just him and me chatting really quickly after the interview. Um, he he recognizes too the life experience angle oh. that he's got going now, especially in Europe. Like that, you know, he talked about, you know, a lot of people don't get to do this. Like he's over there, his girlfriend was his girlfriend and and mom were actually visiting when he decided to go from um, Budapest to England and sign over there. And so he said they were on a little bit of a European uh, vacation right now, the two of them, while he settled into England. I think that deal came about like like quite literally the night before that we talked to him. Like that's that's how quickly arrived in England that night. And, but, but it, being in Europe, like he's really embracing that opportunity to see different cultures, yeah. learn different things. And, and just, it's an adventure, right? Like it, hockey for him over there, it a little, I mean, it's still a grind just like it is when you're over here and bouncing around and stuff. But you know, there's, there's a sort of, if, if you approach it the right way, it can be a real sort of opportunity yeah, to, the, to just there's obviously experience not things the that financial never get to, uh, so. pressure. And he seemed making, to embrace that aspect uh, of it. He's blessed in, in that regard. But there's still a pressure to make it as an athlete and the pressure to make it your own way. And I think sometimes that can be just as uh, challenging to overcome as anything else. Mm-hmm. Well, and the, the ones that succeed are the ones that maybe pressure isn't the right word, but they hold themselves to that standard and strive to achieve it because pressure can be a negative thing if you, if you think about it in those terms. But you know, I, don't, I don't think it, when you hear him talk and when you hear him talk about his experiences, you kind of understand how, how much he embraces that and is not a guy that shies Sheffield away from the first it. And that's place probably why he's managed to find success a little despite having and, to bounce uh, around all over the Deciding to bring in Jeremy Broder. Uh, Martin has the two sons who both play goal. Uh, mm-hmm. They're not the ones in the Enterprise car commercial. Uh, just, <laughs> just in case anybody's wondering, that if you're wondering, is that Jeremy? Uh, That'd be quite the there. talent. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that <laughs> that, that, that wasn't uh, Jeremy and Anthony, but uh, two sons both play goal. Uh, that that's why. And, and the, the part about he was a, a on the travel team and only scored one goal, so he's like, I'm going, I'm going right to the net. Let's go. Lots of fun on uh, on Jeremy Broder. Uh, let's, uh, switch gears over to our, uh, gear segment. And this is, uh, the velocity line Vaughn. We haven't done a lot with Vaughn. Uh, and this is, uh, a chance to catch up with Cam because the, is the V9 out yet? Not yet, but, uh, you can do custom orders and place pre-orders. So much like we had Cam on the other week talking about the Brian's Optic 2 chest and arm and pants, which are also both customizable. Uh, we wanted to sort of get ahead of it because if you do have custom orders, you can go and, and, and fill out your customizer sheet and bring it into the hockey shop source for sports and have them place an order for you so you you get it in time. I can't remember. I'd be honest, I haven't, I'm just brutally honest here. I, I haven't been online to check out whether Vaughn has a customizer. I know in the past, like it's no, literally mentioned they've like, got one on their own site. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So go to, their, go to the website because in the past for, for 
for, for longer than some of the other companies, you were literally filling out a sheet of paper, like an Excel sheet on custom orders. Um, so good to hear they've, they've got a good customizer. You can check it out there and then hit up the boys at the hockey shop and the hockey shop.com for your custom orders. They won't have it in stock for a little while yet uh, to check it out in person, but that'll be soon enough. In the meantime, if you are looking to get ahead of the curve um, and get an order in, uh, make sure you do it through them. It's uh, Kevin Woodley uh, testing out the Vaughn Velocity line with a lot of shots, tips, and redirections with Cam in our gear segment. Source for Sports Surrey, The Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com. Welcome back to The Hockey Shop, Source for Sports here in Surrey, British Columbia, the outskirts of Vancouver, or as I like to call it, goalie heaven down in the basement, surrounded by all this beautiful equipment, and standing next to Cam Matwiv, our resident expert here at The Hockey Shop, Source for Sports, and thehockeyshop.com. Cam, this week, we want to get into a new line, one that's not quite in stores yet, won't be here till April 1st, but you can order custom now through yourself, through The Hockey Shop, Source for Sports, through thehockeyshop.com. Vaughn V9. The hashtag is no testing needed. I might take a few shots at that later. This is a company that once sent us a single leg pad um, to do a review on, which is why all the uh, the photography for said line was a picture of a goaltender in the VH where you couldn't see the back leg because we didn't actually have a second pad. But I digress. No testing needed. You tell me what this pad is, what it's supposed to be, uh, and what goaltenders can expect from this uh, this newest iteration of the Velocity line from Vaughn. Yeah, obviously a continuation on from uh, where they've been in uh, V8. Uh, one of the starker changes I think we've seen in quite a long number of years from them. Basically, some of the biggest callouts for the pad, you're, you're seeing that uh, quick slide material now show up on the slide surface of the pad. It was a custom option that you could do in V8 and obviously got really highlighted with the SLR2 and whatnot. Um, but now it comes stock on the pad. Um, the strap and for those that don't know, obviously we haven't, again, we haven't done reviews of on, um, because they don't like reviews, but we have done the Brian's line with the Opti slide optic, uh, and genetic now with the Opti slide. And, and, and frankly, the, it looks like the same product. Obviously the companies have some ties and from what I understand it pretty much is the same. And that's a positive. We've had a ton of success with the Brian's and a lot of good feedback on it. So again, the trend towards materials that slide better. Uh, Vaughn may have been late to the party, but they've got a good product in this one. And it sounds like you said it continues on the V9. That's correct. Yeah. So you'll find it stock on all their pads and uh, offers a similar uh, color array that uh, Brian's does as well. So um, I can't remember what they all are off the top of my head, but you can check out their customizer, um, which is live up on uh, VaughnHockey.com uh, now, um, which again, you are able to order custom through us um, at any time. So just like we had l- last week when we talked about the Brian's chest protector, the custom chest protector and pants, you go online, you fill out your custom order, then you bring the sheet into you and you can order through the hockey shop and the hockey shop source for sport. Or if you don't happen to live here, just simply email it to me. Nice. And of course, if you have any questions about fit or specs or what you should order, that's when you contact you directly, whether by phone or by email, to sort of get the little insights that you have that'll help them make sure they're ordering something that arrives and is what they expected. That's correct. Yeah. Shout out to uh, a customer that's just recently done that. And we're about to place an optic two chest and optic two pants. You'll remain nameless, but you know who you are. We will let him remain. Are you looking at me? I'm not, I have no idea who this is, but it sounds like the fact we reviewed that last week and they're in here ordering it might be a good sign. Exactly. A little, a uh, little ingle bump. So let's give an ingle <laughs> bump. Sorry, I interrupted you, but let's continue giving an ingle bump to the new V9 line. Cause there are, by the sounds of it, quite a few changes. They have a good video online right now. Credit to them from the marketing side for getting some of that information out there. Yes. Yes. Um, a good chance to check out some of the highlights of the pad. One of the things that we'll notice is the back of the pad has changed. They've gone with a little bit more of a a simpler system. So you've seen the magnetic buckles kind of go the way of the Dodo a little bit, and they've just gone with basically just a traditional Velcro strapping to it. Uh, one centered calf strap and then an internal rotation strap, which they've become to be known for quite well. Um, that's the the quote unquote professor strap. That's the quote unquote professor strap. Yes. Removable if you don't like it, but it comes stock laced in ready to rock and roll for you. That is for guys that like that little bit of a tighter, more connected fit to the pad for sure. Okay. Now general profile and fit, like just for those that maybe not everyone's familiar, right? Like not everybody grew up in Vaughn. I think that's where a lot of their, their market share is people that just have been Vaughn from start to finish, but that's not everybody. So if they're wondering how does it compare to an SLR, I'm assuming the velocity line maintains that that more flexible 
uh, softer profile compared to the SLR line. Th- that's correct. Like it still does uh, play close to its roots in that sense. It still has that more flexible, torsionally flexible pad. Uh, one of the things um, that is offered now and offered on the customizer that uh, previously was something you had to a special request is actually stiffer cores to the pad. Um, they do add a little bit of weight and whatnot, but you are able to change the setup of the pad to actually make it a little bit stiffer, uh, even like almost a pro stiffness, something that we've seen in the NHL use before. So from a flex profile and stiffness standpoint, give me for, for somebody who's coming from another brand, give me an equivalent. Give me something that's comparable. Um, you know, you can kind of walk along some of your other more flexible pads on the market, your E-Flex, uh, your Brian Genetic. Genetic, you know, Warrior GT series, for example, to a lesser extent, even the Vapor, even though it's not quite a fair comparison with uh, what Bauer does compared to Vaughn for sure, but uh, be more of along those lines. Nice. Any other new features on the V9 that, that, that require uh, a little shout out, call out from you here? Uh, a thinner profile to the pad, also a bit of a weight reduction. We're not talking leaps and bounds, but it is a little bit lighter than the VE8. Um, you know, again, it's still pushing forward towards that um, um, sub four, four and a half pound pad looking to, you know, continue with what we all already see on the wall from other companies, for example. So a, ch- a pad that has a, you know, I want to say the word traditional, but I mean, that changes all the time. So a little more of an old school feel and flex. But it's had some modern upgrades and, and registered trademark count up here, but traditional hybrid new feel. Process that one for a second. Yeah, that is me. That that stun silence is me processing. <laughs> you say that again? <laughs> traditional new hybrid feel. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, <laughs> old school feel with a modern twist. How does that work? Sounds sounds old school. It sounds like it might be a more apt description, actually. Um, but not to rip on the marketing. Uh, okay. Um, gloves, blocker, anything different there? Uh, you see similar glove and blocker, um, to, to what you have in the past. They're still offering their XP series, which is eerily similar to a CCM 590. Um, if not is a CCM 590. Um, basically you're getting an updated graphic there. Not too much changing for the padding or anything like that. Um, it's still obviously continuing with their carbon enhanced foams. Um, similar story for their regular standard V9 glove, continuing in their long history of uh, Velocity Series gloves. Um, if you're already familiar with VE8, you feel comfortable with it. Um, again, you're going to feel comfortable in the V9 with either of their two trappers, either the XP or just a standard, you know, V9, for example. And there you have it, the Vaughn Velocity V9. Obviously, been around a long time, and it's nice to see them. I think there's a lot of goaltenders out there that still want that soft, flexible feel. It's nice to see them updating it with with a few more of the modern features, like you mentioned, the sliding and the strapping and the thinner profile and the reduced weight, and trying to accomplish that best of both worlds. There's there's still a lot of goaltenders that are searching for that, and it sounds like the V9 will be a nice step in that direction. Cam, thanks so much for breaking down the V9. Remember, folks, go to the Vaughn website, check out the customizer, fill out your specs, call Cam, email Cam if you got any questions. Hit them up online. If you want to call them directly, Cam, what's the number? 604-589-8299. So you can hit him up directly with any questions. Like I said, get your custom, get, get the custom sort of order ready, prepared, choose your colors, choose your options, check in with Cam, place your order. And the guys, Cam and his crew here at the Hockey Shop Source for Sports in Surrey and thehockeyshop.com will take care of you and make sure that your latest and greatest Vaughn Velocity V9 is exactly what you need and what you expect. That's why we come to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports and thehockeyshop.com. These guys know what they're doing, even on gear with no testing needed. So there's the number to call if you want to get your uh, your custom order in. Uh, and there is a uh, customizer on the uh, Vaughn website. It's the Vaughn Velocity V9. And uh, I, I I grew up with Vaughn, so I have a soft spot in my heart. And uh, and uh, I know that uh, that Kev uh, has uh, has done a good job with the uh, the idea of uh, one pad for a a review. And I give you guys all the credit in the world for coming up with a way to do a review with pictures with one pad with the, with the VH. So that was uh, that was really cool. But uh, this is uh, this is a pad that's got uh, gone through a little bit of a uh, little bit of an evolution. We, we, hey, by the way, and we weren't alone because I also spoke to one of their pro reps who was given only one skate. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him on the ice and he wasn't wearing the right skates. I said, how come you're not wearing the right skates? Well, they only sent me one. <laughs> well, that's different. True story. So, uh, yeah, hmm. that's anyway. 
moving right along. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I I quite enjoy the gear. I I use their gloves uh, almost uh, exclusively. I I really enjoy it, but uh, I understand the the frustrations uh, around. But the, this is a pad that's that's added a, a couple of different wrinkles. So Woody, yeah, and um, but I, you know, and and I think this is important. Um, at its heart, it's still a velocity, right? And and probably important for them not to lose that that. Uh, you know, blend that that traditional feel and soft, flexible pad that a lot of people still look for and, and have come to expect from them, and that they've done exceptionally well for like generations now. So to maintain that feel and add some, you know, a couple different modern twists to it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and it's a bit of a balancing act, right? You wanna you wanna have the latest, you wanna have the greatest. Um, but I think for Vaughn, especially in that velocity line, it's important not to lose that attachment to their roots and. You know, by all indications, without having to the opportunity to try it ourselves, it sounds like they've they found that balance with this line. Obviously, the SLR line, the SLR two for them is more of that you know flat face stiffer pad, um, but they've managed to sort of update that class of classic flexible velocity line. And you know, they keep tinkering and adding little elements. Um, you know, the professor strap is something we mentioned a couple of times. Uh, in that interview with Cam, and, and, and as Hutch was mentioning, maybe not a, uh, not everyone knows what a professor strap is, and that's just kind of like a an inner out inner calf wrap that kind of just wraps around the top of your calf, uh, kind of tightly. Um, just it, it's something that's called a professor strap because Ben Scrivens was the first one to sort of develop it and come up with it. Um, I haven't used it in pads in the past, although I am trying it right now. Uh, it, it What's comes, the idea behind it? Well, Scrivens' idea, like frankly, was to, to A, maintain a connection up on the top of the pad, but I don't think it's a coincidence that it came out at a time when the NHL was forcing guys to shorten pads. Um, you know, the the max height on pads changed in the league, and there was an element of, hey, by, by securing it around the top of the calf, you're sort of keeping as much of that shorter pad higher on the leg and therefore closing the five hole when you drop into the butterfly. So I think for the most part, it's about that attachment and that feeling of being attached to the pad just below the knee. Um, but there was certainly an element, at least for some guys, uh, of wanting to make sure that pad stayed as high as they could keep it on their leg at a time when the NHL was trying to make them shorter and shorter. So do you like it? You've you've had a chance to try yeah, it I, a little bit. Yeah, it, it comes as a, a, a removable option in a new line that we're testing right now. I'm actually not sure if I can even say that because we're not supposed to be talking features yet until we do our full review, but that was my first experience with it. And it, 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 was, it was different in terms of not normally having something there. In some ways, CCM with the, the E-Flex and, and Premier lines uh, with that sort of inner wrap, it, it's a little lower on the calf, but it's similar in sensation. Um, this was a little different though. And I, what I did like about it is you're not coming off your knee stack. Like it's a nice fixed end point when you drop to the ice and you've got that rotation. You know, sometimes I find some of the, the Velcro and elastic combinations uh, around the knee. Like if you get to the edge of the knee stack and you've just got an elastic there, you'll, you'll pop off sometimes. Right. And I mean, every time you, every time I've come off my knee stack, it's an MCL injury, you know, almost automatically. It's just adds so much pressure. So I really like the professor strap in terms of sort of maintaining that attachment and not falling off the knees. You use one, Darren. Oh, I, you know, I mentioned last week that I don't have toe ties on, on my pads anymore. I use the Lundquist loop uh, around the back. And then uh, I ordered uh, from Kineski, they sell them separately, uh, a, a professor strap. And I, I put that on and it keeps me completely anchored, but gives me the, uh, the ability to uh, just to get into different positions with my, with my foot. And I really like the way it it uh, holds the pad up high, but in in just uh, just a luck, I guess it was was what you mentioned about staying on your knee stack. I used to have real issues falling off my knee stack, and uh, and I had custom fit pads. I don't know what it was, and and I I never come off my knee stack anymore because of it. So it's just uh, the the added added impact of it has has been been really really positive. I enjoy it and uh, and it allows me to get away from the toe ties with uh, without the fear that my my uh, velcro is going to come on. I don't think I've come off a knee stack before, but both you guys wear those ginormous knee pads, and I bet you that has something to do yeah. with it. Yeah, um, you're probably right on that. How is how how is the installation of that? Did you have to get Easy. that? So yeah, how to work? 
Uh, it comes, it just, it snaps in. So you just throw them through the, uh, you know, the laces. I, I wear an E-Flex, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Retroflex and there's the, the string on the inside of the pad is, I, I guess is what I'm mm-hmm. referring to. And it just, it, it slides oh, okay. in underneath that string and then it buckles together and then you just, uh, uh adjust it. And, uh, oh, that's, and it's, that's... it's, it's, it's been awesome. I was it curious was too. I, I, I thought you might have to stitch it in, but you're right. On the eFlex, nope. it's got it's got those that lacing that runs right up the leg channel, up the inner calf, yep. and and mm-hmm. right up. Oh, that's a perfect. That's actually quite smart. I like that. Yeah, yeah, it Kines- was really easy. Credit to Kineski on that they, one. They, it, I, I ordered it. Uh, it was it was delivered right away. It was uh, easy to do and um, and really really comfortable too. Uh, I don't even feel it. Uh, and it's not like it's tight, but it does because it's up uh, above your calf. And I don't have the biggest calves uh, by any means, but it does it does hold that pad really uh, really secure. And uh, I probably won't wear uh, I probably won't play without a Kineski or, or without the Professor Strap uh, again. Uh, certainly where I am right now because of that knee stack issue. I'm just looking at them on the Kineski website. They are a super easy install, and they've got all so- sorts of great. Uh great little accessories to add to your gear so definitely a place to check out including the old chin sling if you're wearing an old uh bucket and cage uh, i'm not baby. going chin these sling. guys are going I, way back i tried it yeah. i tried the chin sling i thought it was good uh and then i saw a couple of guys lose teeth and i i just can't do it and i and, and maybe they would have lost teeth anyway but uh but i'm like uh i it's like what, wearing a half, a half shield at in men's league hockey there's just there's no reason to take that chance. I think we're going to have to have, have an episode coming up where we do sort of our, our top 10 little accessories or something like that. Yes, I love yeah. it. Uh, yeah. and, or, or little tweaks or customizations yeah. that you've done to your, uh, done to your gear. Maybe uh, folks can yeah. uh, send in some of their own thoughts and we'll share those as well. I think... Uh, where would we have send that? Uh, that would be podcast at ingolmag.com. <laughs> podcast was- at ingolmag.com. Uh, I was that was actually one of your weaker ones. I'm I'm not I'm not going to pull any punches here. <laughs> I, I'm going to get it in well, post. I, I threw it at him late. Yeah. Hey, uh, we have 20 games left. Uh, off the top of your head, give me your favorite or one or two for the Vesna Trophy this year. Uh, and and I'll go I'll go first. I I know because you guys I just threw this. Yeah, at thanks. You. That's I awesome. Just, I I just I just tossed it at you. It doesn't have to be right. Nobody's nobody's asking you to be to to predict. It's just your your own your own feeling, but, uh, but boy, uh, Vasilevsky's coming on hot and Ben Bishop has some great numbers and Jacob Markstrom, uh, continues to, uh, to, to ride this wave. And, uh, at this point it might be, uh, Vasilevsky Markstrom duel to, to the, to the end. What do you guys think? I think Vasilevsky is going to run away with it because people already is a known quantity and he's having a, a fantastic run, as you said. And I have a sentimental feeling for Marky, but I don't know whether being a West Coast team is going to get noticed well enough. What do you think, Kev? What are you hearing in the media? Well, it's going to kind of depend how much I can rag the puck here while I wait for my ClearSight Analytics uh, access to load in the background. But this was can, supposed to be something but, just yeah. This off the top this isn't logic, head. right? Like I, I I think the argument could easily be made for Markstrom to win this, especially if you think about. The concept of most valuable to your team, even though I know it's not written in there. Um, no, and managers, you, you, no, managers no, no, no. make the vote uh, on this. It, this is a, a travesty. The GM, a, a travesty because they get it wrong a lot. Yeah. Um, no, the only reason I wanted to pull it up, guys, was to to give you an idea of just how much ground. Like I know Vasilevsky's on a heater. The Tampa Bay Lightning are on a heater. Um, but he's got a ton of ground to make up statistically. And I know everybody's going to fall in love with the wins and the raw numbers, but they when are. you break down the proprietary numbers, like Vasilevsky is a plus seven in terms of goals saved on clear sight analytics, which has the best measurement of shot quality of any company I know. And Markstrom is at plus 22. That's 22 goals saved above expected based on shot quality. Hands down the best in the NHL. Number two, and a guy that you didn't even include on your list, Darren, who I think actually is being overlooked because the team he plays behind is actually Tuka Rask. I, no. He was on my, he was in my hand right there. I had him up saying yeah, that tu- uh, what about Tuka? Unquestionably they he has got a good defensive team. The fact that Halak plays well behind them as well makes everybody think it's all about the defense. 
But as as much as that environment is not just solid defensively, it's it's an environment that actually the way they defend suits his style in terms of what they give and what they take away. He's still outperforming it at, like I said, a plus 16 level. It, and then Connor Hellebuck's right there at 13, Robin Lehner at 13. The difference to me is Lehner's not going to get enough starts. I don't know if Tuca gets enough starts. Yeah. You look at the workhorses like Hellebuck, like Markstrom. At the end of the day, if if everything was equal and they finished where they are right now, um, I know he's not going to win it. I'm not even sure he's going to be a finalist. But again, these aren't just you know raw NHL.com numbers. These are the best numbers I've seen in terms of breaking it down and measuring shot quality. I've got 34 different points of data. How many general managers are looking at that before they vote? I do know some general managers talk to their goalie coaches, and I do know some of them, you know, have access to these types of things. Um, at the end of the day, though, like Marky should actually probably be at the top of this conversation. Uh, he won't be. And I would suspect you probably end up with a guy like Tuca and a guy like Vasilevsky just because they're safe favorites and Hellebuck because of all the momentum he built earlier this season. And he too is a workhorse. So, and, and hey, like deservingly so, but one, two, three in terms of statistically. It's Markstrom, Rask, Hellebuck right now, and Laner right behind. Okay. Hey, and you want to know? An, uh, my, you want to know an, my, another guy? Bennington. Yeah. Everybody assumes that St. Louis is this great defensive team. Um, they give a lot more quality looks than people seem to realize, and Bennington's outperforming that environment to the tune of almost twelve goals as well. Well, while, while you're looking at that, where does Lundqvist sit? Because I, I'm not going to name the network, but I saw a long interview on it earlier today. And just kept saying he's having a terrible year. And I'm like, I don't think the numbers say that. It was driving I've, me crazy I've that a major this. network was doing this. We won't name the network, but I have railed against that narrative all year. It's total, I know. Horse, it's total horse crap. Lundquist numbers have tailed off since they sort of stripped them of the number one job. Um, but he is a top 10 goaltender in the NHL still at this age. He's ninth right now at 7.81 goals saved above expected. Uh, again, these are clear side analytics uh, numbers. And I'm just looking at his save percentage right now. I believe he's, you know, in terms of above expected, yeah, he's seventh. Right there with Bennington, right there with Hellebuck. And it's amazing how narratives form. Connor Hellebuck is a, because the team isn't expected to do good, Connor Hellebuck is seen as a Vesna Trophy finalist. Henrik Lundqvist, people just casually mentioned that like he's done and he's having a terrible year because the raw numbers are below what we've come to expect from him. But when you adjust for how bad a team they are defensively, Hank is still right there, top seven. The problem is he doesn't even get to play anymore because Shesterkin's the real deal and they're trying to keep Georgiev in the mix. And I got to be honest with you, I never thought I'd see the day when, when I thought he might actually leave New York. I thought he'd finish there. They're saying all the right things, but the way they're handling him and treating him in terms of not playing him at a time when he should be battling Marc-Andre Fleury for that fifth spot in the all-times win list, it, it almost feels like they're just trying to subtly push him out the door, or at least have him consider making a move, something I don't think he ever would have considered before this stretch. But in terms of can he still stop pucks? Yes, and at an elite level. Uh, the network that we're talking about that we won't name, and we aren't going to name it, but does it, uh, does it reply, uh, re uh, just rhyme with Ben or Bet? <laughs> but we're not going to name it. I'm just, just wondering. Okay. Okay, you guys aren't going to answer that, but uh, uh, I'll give you the finalist. The Vezina Trophy finalist for 2019 and 20 will be Andre Vasilevsky, Jake Markstrom, and Ben Bishop. There you go. Just we'll be able to uh, to reach back and and say that I was right when that comes out in June. I know you guys don't believe me, but uh, but I have inside knowledge. Perfect. Yeah. I can see the future. I can predict things. And uh, I, I'm mostly I, wrong when I predict, so I'm not saying a thing. I uh, I also look forward to the time when we can talk about a father-son uh, tandem from the Hutch uh, household. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to that. Uh, thanks for doing this. And that was a great get, uh, Woody, uh, with Jeremy. Uh, you jumped on that, and uh, and and we're quick to uh, to make that happen. And uh, thanks to Jeremy too for uh, for being so open for that conversation, what uh, less than twenty four hours after he he joined the team, had one practice and, <laughs> and and rolled into town. So that was pretty cool. And they've got a great website too. So uh, so so check them out. So nice job, Woody. Thanks. And Hutch, uh, stay warm. I know you're in a in a northern climate there, and I, I worry about you when when things get uh, get a little chilly out there on the island. Oh, it's tough on the island. Yeah, yeah, I feel. 
Uh, Thank you. Well, I it's, appreciate it's, it. Uh, it's uh, nice to know that they have other royalty to chase around on that uh, on that part of the world, other than just you uh, being uh, part of the the goaltending uh, royalty and the the king of goaltending. Thanks to uh, Hutch and Woody and uh, Jeremy Broder, as well as Cam from Source for Sports Story, the Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop dot com. And thanks to you. Make sure you check out the uh, In Goal Magazine and uh, and check out all the latest uh, content there and In Goal Premium for an opportunity to win a Braden Holtby taped stick that you can watch him uh, go to work on on the In Goal Premium uh, side of things. I'm Darren Millard. Just keep your stick on the ice, your glove up, and your eyes open, and make sure you have fun. <laughs> <laughs>